again for being at Faith. We continue this morning in our journey through Scripture over the summer. Um, I hope you've been following with us through the Bible Project. So this, so this week's readings takes us to what, I, what we're going to focus on this morning is a passage from Ezekiel 37. And so you can follow along if you'd like to with us. But, so that's where we're landing this morning. Um, how many here love to, tra- like, love to travel? Love to travel. Me too. Me too. I don't, I don't know if it was my military upbringing is what kind of instilled this love for travel, but I love to travel. And it's not so much the flying in the airplane as it is about experiencing other cultures. I love to experience how they live and what they eat, and, and all of that about that just intrigues me. I love that. But I'm actually, if I were honest, I'm actually only good for about seven to ten days. I have this window where I love this, and then it switches over to, I want to go home, right? Because after, there's just certain things. You, you want to eat your own food again, and you want to sleep in your own bed again, and you want to do all the things that are normal and familiar to you again. You love this, but it's time to go home, right? Ever felt that way? I'm, Dara and I just got back from traveling in Europe to celebrate our 40th wedding anniversary, and we landed in, at our last several days, four days in Venice, Italy. How wonderful is that, right? How cool to be in Venice. It was wonderful. It was awesome. But you know what? After about four days of pizza and pasta, literally for about every meal, we're like, mm, nah, I'm, you know, I would kill for McDonald's hamburger. <laughs> and I don't even like McDonald's hamburgers. <laughs> and so our very last day, our very last meal before we left the next morning, we heard there was a Burger King. I mean, like, now, in Venice, they don't have, like, um, Mexican or Chinese or Thai, the, all the stuff we love. It's just pasta and pizza. So we heard there was a Burger King somewhere, and so we went out on this hunt to find... I, I don't like Burger King, but I would, you know, I just need a hamburger, right? So we found it. We just relished in this $18 burger and fries and just... We're just we're happy campers. We didn't care how much it cost because we wanted to go home to the familiar. Our passage this morning, Ezekiel is, is, is based on the book of Ezekiel. Ezekiel was a prophet, and he wrote to a people, the Israelites, who were in a place of exile. They were not home. They were conquered by the Babylonians, and they were taken from their home. They left friends and family and land and everything they loved and knew, and they were forced to travel 700 miles to a, a, a country called Babylon. And the worst thing about it was that their beloved temple back in Jerusalem had been destroyed. Everything that had connected them to the presence of God was gone. And, it, and they were devastated. How they got a, kind of came into the situation of, of being conquered and taken into captivity was that from the very beginning of their, their history, God had made a covenant relationship. It was a relationship with them that I will be your God and you will be my people. And they said, yes, we would love that. But, but as often happens after a while, you know, we, we're, we're a distracted people. They say yes and they were sincere and they meant it. But after a little while, their attention began to be turned to other things. And they placed their... And whatever, whatever your attention is, whatever you focus on, it cultivates a devoted heart. Your heart will be devoted to that. Whatever you pay attention to the most, your heart will be devoted. Well, that was happened. They, they kind of turned their head and began to focus on other gods, and their hearts were taken. And so God, in his graciousness and his mercy, sent spokesmen on his behalf to come and say, Return to me. Come back to me. I want to be that God, that covenant relation who is kind and generous and gracious to you. But scripture tells us over and over and over again that they would not listen. God spoke over and over and over through these these spokesmen. But it says, but they would not listen. And there's always consequences for us not listening. And that was part of the reason for exile. And so... When Ezekiel writes this to them, they found these these people found themselves in a place they didn't want to be far from home, and they were desperate, and they were helpless, and they were hopeless. And that's when Ezekiel comes on the scene. He see, here's the really great thing. Through this, God 
was as he always does, in this place of hopelessness and despair, God wanted to reassure them that there would be a time of refreshing and restoring. There was, would be a time of coming home again. And it's through Ezekiel, in the passage that we're going to look at today, it's through a vision that God communicated through Ezekiel to the people that exile is horrible. It's a terrible place to be, far from home and far from God and all the things you love. But there will come a time through this vision that God was telling them there will be a time of restoration and hope again. So let's pick it up in Ezekiel chapter 37, beginning with verses 1 and 2. This is Ezekiel writing. He says, God grabbed me. God's spirit took me up and set me down in the middle of an open plain strewn with bones. He led me around and among them a lot of bones. There were bones all over the plain, dry bones bleached by the sun. These weren't just bones. These were really, really dry bones. You've seen those kinds of bones where they're white, pure white. They've been dry for a very long time, bleached by the sun. This is, the scripture tells us that God was showing these bones as a metaphor for the spiritual condition of the Israelites in exile. They were dry. They were dead. There was no breath in them. And they were scattered and dead. So look at verse 11, how that's described. It says, then God said to me, son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Listen to what they're saying. Our bones are dried up. Our hope is gone, and there is nothing left of us. Sometimes we say that, don't we? We sometimes get caught up in the same cycle of, of our devotedness to God, where we, we, there's a place and a moment where we say, God, I devote my whole heart. I surrender my life to you, and we mean it. We're absolutely sincere, 100% sincere. This is how I want to live. I want to be in relationship with you. I want you to be that God to me. But as often happens is all of a sudden we get distracted. There's a lot of things to distract us, isn't there? We get distracted, and we begin focusing on other things, and those other things begin to, to turn our hearts away. Those, the, our attention draws our hearts to these other things, and all of a sudden, and so God is really faithful. He is so faithful. He loves us so much that he's so faithful to always speak to us, to draw us back, always this invitation to come back, always this invitation to turn our hearts back towards him. But just like the Israelites, as so often we don't listen. We're so distracted, our hearts are so focused on other things, we don't hear the invitations of God wooing us back. And, often, and then one day we possibly might wake up and realize that we are far from God and disconnected from him. And oftentimes, we don't know how to get back. What they found out, and what I think we're going to find out, is that God delights in bringing dead things back to life. So in verse 3, it continues in this passage. It says, he said to me, son of man, can these bones live? Now, I don't know about you, does that seem like a trick question to you? Like here's this valley of really dead bones and God asks Ezekiel, can these bones live? You know, the answer seems obvious, right? So you're going, I don't know. So look at Ezekiel's answer, I love this. He says, Master God, only you know that. Now how many know that's a safe answer, right? To those kinds of questions. Only you know that. I think I would have said, are you kidding me? No way, Jose. These are dead, dead. Like, there is no life, no way. But I love that Ezekiel. Instead of saying that, because I would have said that. I love that he, re he left open the door, the possibility for divine intervention. He left the door open that God just might be able to move on something dead. I love that. And if you're here this morning, you're thinking of the things in you that have stolen life from you. And there's a lot of things that can do that, right? There's so many things that steal away our hope and our joy. So many things. Would you just be open to the possibility for divine intervention to this morning? Just the possibility that God might move on your behalf and restore life to you. Instead of looking at that and going, nope, 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 dead, dead. Could you just be open this morning? 
for the Holy Spirit to speak life to your soul. Verse 4, look at verse 4. It says, he said to me, prophesy over these bones. Dry bones, he's just talking to those bones now. Dry bones, listen. Listen, here we go. We're always charged with not listening. Dry bones, listen to the message of God. Listen. God the master told the dry bones. Now, there are some passages, I mean, there's a lot of passages like this, but this is one of those passages where you just can't read it to check off the box. You're going through your devotions, you're reading this passage, you read this and you check it off and you go, you know, this is one of those passages you can't read like that because you're so going to miss what it has to say. You got to read it differently. Here's how you should read this next passage. Ready? And the ma- God the master told the dry bones, watch, watch this. I sometimes, my kids, pay attention. Hey, right here, right here, woo! You don't do that, but I do. Pay attention. You got to hear this. I am bringing the breath of life to you, and you will come to life. Ah. I will attach sinews to you and put meat on your bones and cover you with skin and breathe life into you, and you'll come alive, and then you'll realize that I am God. Here's the deal. You won't recognize God in your presence, in your midst, in you, until you come alive. But when God does something in you, when God breathes his life into you, all of a sudden you recognize that God is real. And he's real in you. And he's active in you. Oh, you got to read it that way. Right? This is what God is saying. This, This passage tells us that God's ways and his purposes in your life are always redemptive. Whatever God is doing in your life, it will always take you from death to life every time. God never takes us from life to death. He is the giver of life. He is the life-giving God. And whatever he's doing, it will bring life to your soul. Whatever is going on, the loss you've experienced, the unforgiveness you feel, the sorrow, the pain, the regrets, the disappointments, God wants to speak to those dead places in you and bring you out. We just sang a song. I wrote it down. Hold on, let me find it. We just sang a song that talks to this. I love this. It says, hallelujah, he has set me free. Now, these aren't just past. I want you to hear these words, not just in the past, but in the present. Because what God is doing isn't just in the past. He has done marvelous things. But what he wants to do is in the present, and you can only experience God in the present moment. You can't experience God in the past, and you can't experience him in the future. We live in the present, and we experience God in this moment right now. You can't hold out for a different place in a different time. It's right now. So in this place right now, God wants to set us free. He has broken every chain. Death has lost its grip. The chains that we experience today, the parts of us that are given over to death in our lives today, and it says salvation is in his name. It's salvation for this moment. It's not salvation for eternity. It is that, but it's more than that. We live in the present. What God wants to do is now. He wants to save us now. All the things that bring death to our our lives, all the things that hold us down, all the things that keep us from God, all the things that keep us from living life to the full, God wants to bring salvation to those places. And it's a daily thing. He wants to do that to us. See, the the thing that, um, so God is continually, always, faithfully, creatively bringing death or bringing life to dead places always there is never a moment in your life that God is not at work never a moment that he's not inviting you into something new and fresh and life-giving there's never a moment he's not at work always now two things I want you to notice from this passage is that God didn't say to tell Ezekiel, tell these bones what to do, tell them so they can get their lives together. Tell them to buck up and make something happen so they can come alive. Do you notice it did not say that? He did not say, okay, here's five ways that you can make life happen 
and, and you can get live again. Here's 10 simple, easy ways to. It's not up to us. The life that we desire, the healing that we desire, the comfort that we desire, all the things that we so desperately need in our life does not come from us. It's not about doing the right things or revving ourselves up to be spiritual. Everything that we need is not on the out, it's on the in, has already been given to us. Everything that we need is the presence of God in us. See, the thing is, we're always trying to control life. You know, life, just life is happens. There's just stuff that, it just knocks us off, you know. There's just stuff. And our first reaction is to grab for things to make life work, make it better, make this go away, make this happen. We're just always about control and trying to manipulate life in such a way that we can make it work on our terms. Don't we do that? You do too. (laughs) Because that's our nature. It's always about trying to fix life because life gets messy and it hurts. But the thing is, is that the, the life that God is bringing is not always about getting life fixed. Because there are just things, some things in life that can't be fixed. It doesn't come, the life that God offers doesn't come by our circumstances being just right. Well, soon as this then, then. well, it, when this does, then I will. It doesn't happen that way. The neat thing is, is that God is in the midst of our unfixedness. He has not, when life goes crazy and life happens, he doesn't abandon us. He doesn't abandon us. He is the God who is for us, not against us. And the hope that you need and the help that you need is found from God who's in the midst of it. He's not outside of it. Don't think that God has abandoned you. He has come into the middle of it. And that's where he wants us to turn our hearts towards him who is in the thick of things with us. He is there if you look for him. He is at work creatively and redemptively in the midst of our unbrokenness and our unfixedness. He has not left you. The life that he brings to you is in the midst of all of the stuff. He's for you and not against you. So don't give up on God too soon. Don't give up on God too soon. He's not abandoned you. He's closer than you think. But we often look to other things, don't we? Life gets messy. Life happens and it tears at us. It tears at our hearts and our souls. And we start to grab for anything that will make it feel better. Anything that will hopefully make it go away. But all of those things don't bring life to you. They come up empty every time. Look at verses 7 and 8. It says, this is Ezekiel writing again. He says, I prophesied just as I had been commanded. And as I prophesied, there was a sound. Oh, a rustling. The bones moved and came together, bone to bone. And I kept watching. Sinews formed and muscles on the bones and then skin stretched over them. Whoa, what a sight, huh? All of a sudden, these dry bones are starting to come to life. And all of the things that had been lost are starting to come together. And before him stood a complete person. But then he says this, but they had no breath in them. You know, we can look good on the outside and be dead on the inside. Have no life in us. And we can do that a pretty long time but not forever. Our souls won't have it. But it's amazing how long we can can go disconnected from God. We can do things for God. We can say all the right things and not really experience him in a real way. Now, the Hebrew root for breath, it's called ruah. But interesting, this word ruah, means three things. It's used over and over through the Old Testament for spirit, for wind, and for breath. So whenever you hear read about the breath of God, it's the spirit of God. It's the spirit of this, this breath. And so 
these bones had no breath of God in them, no spirit residing in them. Look at verse 9. It says, he said to me, prophesy to the breath. Prophesy, son of man, tell the breath. God the master says, come from the four winds. There's all, four, all three of those words in there, breath, wind, and spirit. Um, breathe on these slain bones. Breathe life into them. Breathe life. And so I prophesied just as he commanded. The breath entered them and they came alive. They came alive and they stood on their feet, a huge army. Look at verses 12 and 14. Therefore, prophesy, tell them that God the master says, I will dig you up your graves and bring you out alive. The graves, the things that have, have held you in death, the things that have held you in bondage. He says, I will bring you out alive oh, my people, and then I'll take you straight to the land of Israel. When I dig up graves and bring you out as my people, you'll realize that I am God. I'll breathe my life into you, and you'll live. And then I'll take you straight back to your land, and you'll realize that I am God. I've said it, and I'll do it to God's decree. That is the God we love and serve. This is his heart. I'll bring you back. No matter how dead, how hopeless, how helpless life or you seem. I'll bring you back. I'll breathe my life into you. In Ezekiel, a few chapters earlier in the book of Ezekiel, he made this promise in Ezekiel 11, um, is this. Actually, the second thing I want you to notice that speaks to that. Look at God's initiative in all of this life thing. God is the one who initiates everything right? He's the one that says, I will do this. I'll bring life. I will do this. These are the things that he, he, he's the one that does the work. He's the one that's at, active in our lives. And Ezekiel 11 says, I will, bring, I will give them an undivided heart. I will put a new spirit in them. I will remove them from their heart of stone, and I will give them a heart of flesh. This is God's work. This is not our work to do. We can't rev ourselves up into life because this, we're talking about real life, not fake life, real life that's deep within us, that overflows out of us. The thing is, the life that God brings to us is always constant, like I said, but we can be so distracted that we can miss it. The thing that God is up to, the life that he is giving to you, the hope that he wants to bring, the comfort that you so desire, He is always bringing that, but we can be distracted by other things and miss it. And we can also try to rely on other things, something that will bring hope, something that will peace, something that will alleviate my fears and my anxiety. I just need something to help so I'm not so afraid. We grab for other things, but all of those things, real absence of fear comes from God's spirit, the breath that he breathes in us. We're going to talk about that in just a second. Jesus in in John chapter 10, 10 said this, I have come. Here's this initiative. Jesus came that you might have life. I have come. It comes from me. It doesn't come from outside. It comes from from outside of ourselves. It comes from God. Jesus is saying that we have to keep looking for God in the externals. The life that you want comes from him, from his presence in us, and we're going to talk about that. Life doesn't come from outside. It comes from inside, the life that God breathes in us. So let's take a look at some of these scriptures. How, what does this look like? Is this, how does that happen? What does that look like? What does that mean? I want to run you through just a couple of scriptures about this. It says in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, it says, don't you realize, don't you realize that all of you together are the temple of God and that the spirit of God lives in you. Don't you realize that God, his spirit, lives in you? That's where the life comes from. It comes from the spirit who lives in us. Now, interesting, in that that little tiny word called in, where the spirit lives in you, that little tiny word means this in this passage. It means to hunker down. It means to dwell to make yourself at home, to go deep. So in other words, the Spirit of God hunkers down in you. He goes deep. He makes his home. He dwells in us. 
That's what the Spirit of God does. That's God's presence in us. He he comes and hunkers down and makes his home in us. Look at Ephesians chapter 2, verse 22. It says, and in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his Spirit. A dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. You know, in the Old Testament, God's presence was contained in, a t- in was housed in a temple. But God said, I will no, no longer be housed in, in brick and mortar and stone. I will come and live in you. You become my temple. I live in you and bring life to you. Now, you got to hear this next passage. This is, it explains it so well. Found in Romans chapter 8, it says this, but if God himself has taken up residence in your life, you can hardly be thinking more of yourself than him. You know, all of a sudden, when we know that God has taken up residence, we don't focus so much on our hangups and her, you know, on all of the things that are happening to us. All of a sudden, our attention gets diverted to him who lives in us. Instead of focusing on the circumstances and what we're up against and the, and the fear that wants to, be, to overtake us, instead of focusing on those, all of a sudden we begin to focus on the God who lives in us. Right? If we're convinced and we know and we believe that God resides in our hearts. It says, that, and anyone, of course, who has not welcomed the invisible but clearly present God, the Spirit of Christ, won't know what we're talking about. But for you who have welcomed him, in whom he dwells, even though you still experience all the limitations of sin. How many know life doesn't get cheery after we accept Christ? Right? We still experience all the stuff. All the stuff. But he says, you will still experience life on God's terms, on the way God brings life. There will still be stuff, but it's different because God brings life to you in the midst of all of that stuff. It stands to reason, doesn't it, that the alive and present God who raised Jesus from the dead moves into your life. And he'll do the same thing in you that he did in Jesus, bringing you alive to himself. When God lives and breathes in you, and he does, as surely as he did in Jesus, you are delivered from that dead life from all of this stuff, the things that have wounded us, the pain that still seems to control our life, the anger that we can't seem, we try and deal with it and it won't go away, the loss that we experience that seems like it will overtake us. He says that he will deliver you from those things. He will bring life to those. You don't always have to feel like loss will have the final answer. You don't always have to feel like you will never be the same or feel different again. Because these things are not the final, do not have the final answer. He says, with his spirit living in you, your body will be as alive as Christ. The same spirit that lived in Jesus, the same spirit that powerfully rose rose him from the dead, raised him from the dead, lives in you. And the same things, that power that raised him, it's the same power that will bring life to your souls. The things that have wounded you and and hurt and you think will never, the, the regrets that you have of the past, God brings those dead things to life again and restores and redeems all things in your life. 1 John 4 says, this is how we know we're steadily and deeply in him and he in us. He has given us life from his life, from his very own spirit. Wow. Somebody say wow. Right? Thanks. (laughs) Because like this is wow. This is wow. God has given you everything that you need. Everything that you desperately, your heart cries out for. The comfort that you need. The peace when life is just, in up people, the peace that you need in the midst of your circumstance. Here's the deal, is that, that so, you know, sometimes when we pray, when we, when we look to God to heal us, to, to restore us, oftentimes I think we look to the God who is out there. Oh God, please come and restore. 
God is not out there. He's not out there. We're, he's not out there, and we're going to try and convince him to come. We don't have to convince God to come because he is already here. We need to look, we need to focus our attention in a different place. God is not out there, he's already here. And when you step out and ask him to help, when you cry out to God for help, he's already there. He's already at work. He's not a God who is afar off. He is a God who lives in us. Think about when you pray. When you pray, how do you imagine where God is? Oh, God. Oh, God. Please come. I did that for years until I finally realized, no, no, no. He lives in me. And he's bringing life to me even before I know it. He's already at work creatively birthing life in me before I ever know it. And my job is to discover that place where God is at work and to respond to that. God, what are you doing? What are you healing? What are you restoring? And he's so faithful to do that. So faithful. And then he invites you to partner with him, to respond to that. And that's where, you know, when scripture says things like rejoice in the Lord always, that's not for you to fake it. That's not so you can fake it. Like, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just, gonna, I'm just gonna be joyful. What if the spirit of life births joy in you? Is that real joy? What about comfort? I just, I'm just so, I'm so, I'm just, I'm just going to be, I'm going to hang on. I'm going to try harder. I'm going to have peace if it kills me. What if the spirit of God is birthing peace in you? And you begin to recognize that peace. And you begin to recognize the comfort that God brings. How many know that when it says in here three times, and then you'll know that I am God, then you will know that he is God. When you begin to feel the the spirit of Christ come alive in you, and he begins to bring peace that you've never experienced, peace that the world cannot give, you begin to experience his presence and his nearness, then you know that you know that you know that God is real, right? When you experience this living Christ in you who births life in you. You know, I think for too long, we've been content about talking thinking about God. We've been content with talking about God. We've been too content in not knowing him in a real experiential way. See, the thing is, God is a personal God. He can only be known personally. He's the self-revealing God who wants you to know him personally. You, each one of you, can know him and experience him in a personal way. God is not an abstract theological thought. I got to tell you, he's not something we put on a wall, a plaque on the wall or a saying on the wall. He's not a principle that we try to live by. He is a God who is real, who invites you to know him and experience him in a real way. He's personal. He speaks to you. What he's doing in your life is different than what he's doing in my life because he's personal. And he wants you to know him personally, not as a theological construct, but in a real way. I think it says in, in, in Isaiah when, when God's people had completely fallen into a life of external ritual and observance. It's just all about the outside. It's always just about the behavior, right? This is what God lamented. He said, these people, they honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. And then we wonder where God is in tragedies of life. If he is just a ritual and an external observance to us, we won't be able to experience it fully in the midst of our tragedies. I think this is what Jeremiah 2 said. They have forsaken me. They have forsaken me. The living water. The living water. And they have dug their own cisterns. Their broken cisterns that cannot hold water. How many times have I said, oh, I need, I need so much peace in my life. I just, I just need, I just need to know that I want this loss. And I start digging my own well. Thinking that I can experience real peace and real hope only to to find out all of those things come up short. The abundant life that Jesus talked about 
is really about discovering and responding to the place in our souls where God dwells. See, here's the deal. This is what I often say or tell myself at least. We all have stuff. We have things in life that tear at us and threaten to overtake us. But I want to say today that all will be well. How do you know that? Because you will be well. Because you will be well. Because the Spirit of Christ is breathing life into you. That whatever threatens to overtake you won't. Because you will be well. Because the Spirit of life is in you. Perhaps you're here this morning and you say, in your heart, you say, my bones, just like the Israelites, my bones are dried up. My hope is gone. And there is nothing left in me. And you're asking the same questions those bones did. Will, will I ever live again? Will I ever be free from? Will I ever feel this way again? Whatever is dead in you, whatever is scattered and broken and weary and fearful and anxious, God wants to make you alive again this morning. How does that happen? Well, do you know every Sunday we talk about that, how that happens? Every Sunday. I went back and listened to our, our podcast this week, like the last seven. Do you know every single Sunday we spoke to this? Every Sunday. One time it was a sermon on lament. How can you be healed by God if you don't acknowledge the things that have wounded you? God can't heal things that aren't offered. One saint was on awe. When you stand in the awe of God, there is something that happens. There's life that comes to your soul. So much of it. Can I, I'll give you a hint on where to start. So where do we start? It happens in a thousand ways that God, that God wants to do this great work of restoration in your heart. It happens a thousand ways. But if you want to know where to start, let's start here. It happens by paying attention. Instead of looking to other things, we run here and we run here and we're so distraught. We run to other things to try and get life this, to try and make us feel better, to try and ease the pain. Instead of that, how about if we focus our hearts on the God who lives in us? How about we just, for this week, pay attention to the God who lives in us and instead of to the other things that we hope will bring life? Can we just do that this week? Right? Can we just now? Here's the problem with focusing our hearts: is is that we we have distracted hearts. We're distracted people. So it's gonna it's gonna take take some intention this week to do that. You're gonna have to say, I'm I'm gonna set aside these things and whatever it is that distracts you. What? There's all sorts of things that take our time and our energy and our focus. You're gonna have to. How about this guy? I didn't bring it up. I forgot to bring it. Maybe we're gonna have to set something aside and focus our hearts. Pay attention to the God who wants to speak to your heart. The God who wants to breathe life into you. So you know what I thought we'd do today? Will you bear with me? It's like, we're going to practice. We've got to start some. How about in this moment? Well, could we start in this moment focusing our hearts? Would that be okay? I'm going to ask you for just a minute. to, fo And it might be the longest minute of your life. It may feel that way because we're not practiced in this. But how about if for just one minute, let's put our hands on our hearts. And can we just, in, the, in a quiet, focus our hearts for one minute on the God who lives in you and wants to bring life to you? Jesus, this morning we pause. We put aside the distractions that we've brought with us, and in this moment we pause and we focus our attention on you. Oh, there's so much that you're inviting us into. Help us not to miss those invitations to life. This week I pray that our hearts would be focused, that we would, we would take moments throughout our day and we would pause 
and turn our hearts and our attention to you. And may you bring life, may you bring healing to our souls. I ask it in the name of Jesus.